Well, ladies and gentlemen, as promised, I have another fantastic guest, one we've been waiting for quite some time, and we're so happy to have him with us today. I have veteran Nick Cottrell, who's also known as uh, the Big Earl. You'll hear about that from his awesome uh, podcast series. Uh, just to get started, uh, we'll do a fun little radio check. How do you, how do you read me, over? Uh, loud and clear, over. Leave me yeah. Charlie. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> oh, man, this is so fun. I'm so glad you could join us. Um, I guess we'll just dive right in, if you don't mind. We'll we'll do what we call the origin story of your service how did how did you, this come about why did you pick the branch the 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 mos how did how did all those decisions line up for you perfect yeah well, it's a it's a fun one to reflect on uh I, i'll start you know backwards planning i retired in 2022 uh out of the Sergeant majors academy uh out of fort bliss but i pretty much you know i was an 80s baby so it, like 80s and early 90s movies controlled my life uh, and specifically like Tom Berenger and Charlie Sheen. So I either wanted to be Charlie Sheen from Major League or I wanted to be Barnes from Platoon, right? right. And they were both in the same, you know, same movies together. Right. Uh, so I, I gave baseball a good shot, played played college, uh, did some, you know, independent league stuff afterwards. And then, you know, it, it went to, went like most, most baseball players don't make it. So it didn't make it. And, uh, Went to the recruiter. However, I was still like a, a lost puppy, kind of confused and, you know, kind of still thinking I could relive the glory days in baseball. And uh, I said, hey, I went to the recruiter and I said, hey, I go, I want a job that I can finish college and, you know, in the reserves. I'm like, finish college and then, you know, and just that's all I really want to do right now. Uh, so I was a train driver in the Army, in the, in the Army Reserve. Uh, and I went to basic uh, had an infantry drill sergeant, you know, at Fort Jackson that uh, really, you know, and every, a lot of people have these stories of that, fam that, that favorite drill sergeant, that one that mentors people. Yeah. And I just, he was a 101st combat patch guy with Ranger Tab, you know, all the bells and whistles. And I was like, this guy's pretty cool. Like this guy, I started, I started like, you know, really, really like enjoy the army uh, in basic, you know, and, but I'm in basic with a bunch of cooks and truck drivers and no offense to them, but like, right. But I'm, you know, I'm going to be a train driver, you know, so I'm, I'm sitting here at the FTX and me and there's other guy uh, were two PT guys. So I came out of college athletes, you know, so I, I was in shape. And he said, uh, what are you, what MOS are you going to be? And I was like, I'm going to be an 88 uniform, you know, and he's like, what the is that? You know, and I was like, um, a train driver. <laughs> and he's like, he goes, oh, what a waste. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, you need to. Go active duty as soon as you can, and you need to go be an Army Ranger. Uh, and I was like, oh, okay. So I did my AIT. Went to my first my first drill. Uh, it was the worst experience of my life as far as like having pride in the Army. And then you're at this reserve drill, and like just absolute like no standards. Just you know, like I'm like I'm not I don't know where I am right now because I'm fresh out of boot at AIT. And I I go to the commander. I said, hey, I'm supposed to ask you for a condition of release to go active duty. Uh, and he's like, well, what do you want to do? And I was like, I want to go be an airborne ranger. And he's like, oh, okay. You know, and so he signed it, you know, and yeah. uh, I was sitting there in the recruiting office and uh, they said, well, we don't have any 11 uh, Bravo Victor slots. And I was like, well, what do you have? And he's like, we have 92 golf Victor. Oh. And I was like, I was like, well, that's a cook. And I was like, um, I've already been to basic training. I've already, and in fact, with all of those guys, like, so like, no, I guess I'm not signing up. And this is back in the day when, uh, you know, recruiters were, unfortunately, you know, the highest suicide rate because they were treating like a combat mission where if you didn't get somebody in, they, you know, they, their, their life was over, their NCOERs were struck, you know, crushed. So I can see this recruiter start sweating. He's like, oh, man, you know. And, uh, and so the guy makes a phone call and he goes, well, what about 18 X-ray? And I was like, well, what's that? And he's like, that's a special forces recruit. And I was like, oh, man, I can skip the whole show. <laughs> I can just go right to Green Beret and send it. We'll send it. <laughs> send it. Yeah. Um, so I went to, I went to back to basic. They inserted me like in week nine, you know, um, and then went to airborne school, went to Sopsy and went to selection, had a blast in selection actually, because Sopsy was a kick in the pants. Uh, like, I mean, it was straight. Like I, I was like, think of like what 1960s or 70s boot camp would be like. I think Sopsy was it, you yeah. know, like they just crushed you. Uh, and, but it made, made us in tremendous shape for selection. And then I was a 24 day non-select. So that was my first like real, like failure in the army, like in life. I, 
even though I didn't, you know, I don't think I failed. It just is what it is. Uh, went to the 82nd, uh, deployed uh, like two times in the first three years, and uh, then went to be, uh, went to Ranger School and uh, became an RI, and and then went and did my first iron time out in Hawaii, and then got all uh got banged up in 2007 pretty good in uh, Samar, Iraq, and you know my body never fully recovered from that, and just you know as you get older in the military and your injuries compile, it's it was either time to, uh, I think it, I call it quits about at 18 years. Cause, uh, you know, I was going to be a Sergeant major and it was like, do I want to be that guy that I've hated my whole life that can't do PT, but tells everybody else to do PT or do I, <laughs> do I just, it was called right. a day. Uh, and so I called it a day. And, uh, yeah. so that, that was kind of the, the long semi short version of no, uh, good, good, shows. good for you because, uh, yeah, there's quite a few out there that, you know, there's a, there's a time where you just got to see what's best for everyone else going forward. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Family too and everything. And it's just, you know, oh, sure. And a good thing about the Sergeant Major Academy was there was a lot of, you know, retired Sergeant Majors there and, and always the VIPs that are coming in there, you know, you're, you're picking their brain and listening to them and had a lot of good mentors come in and be like, you know, do you have any type of leadership goal? Like, is there like something you really, really want to be? Cause like, if not, like get out. <laughs> like you know like so uh, good mentorship and uh I, I i think i made the right choice so far doesn't matter we'll figure it out later yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely and and i i may have misheard you but did you say the retirement year was uh was that 2020 2022 oh 22 okay i did miss you yeah yeah so you were also getting out of time that was really hectic because they were just coming out of the you know pandemic chaos and all sorts of things so yeah yeah good, yeah good call no. And that's when I start. I start, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. That's when I, I started veteran trash talk um, with a buddy of mine in the, in during COVID, same, similar to you guys. Yeah. Uh, and part of that was they stopped all of my pain management, you mm-hmm. know, and was, I was doing like phone calls and I'm like, you know, I'm a, I'm an E8 that works in a trade doc unit. That's not deployable and I can't get worked on. I'm like, what are they, what are they doing to veterans? Right. You know, what are they, what are they, how are they treating them? So I called a buddy of mine who had to get out for injuries. And I was like, how you doing, man? And he was like, not good. I'm like, it's like funny that you called me. He's like, I, uh, you know, I can't get physical therapy and you know, they won't tell me what my next appointment's going to be. And I was like, well, what do they do for you? It's like, well, they just double my prescriptions. And he's like, I threw those away and just started drinking a lot. And I was like, well, let's, let's jump on a zoom call. And we always thought, talk, thought about starting something that was about sports uh, talking about like UFC and NFL and, uh, but we didn't do that right away. We have it now, but, uh, we brought another friend of mine who just retired out of fifth special forces group, another 82nd guy that we grew up together. He went green beret. And then our, our really good friend, Dave, uh, he's not retired out of rec- recruiting command, but he grew up in the same 82nd unit as we did. And we just started recording it and it went nuts. We got to like 70,000 followers. Yeah. Like that's months. awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, I've been watching and enjoying. And of course, you know, you and I have some uh, you know, familiar uh, names and, and folks out there. Uh, it's it's fun. And, and and I know it's called Talk Trash. And, and folks, if you haven't tuned in yet, you definitely want to check it out. There's links on our site. You can go right to his podcast and all his work. But um, yeah, there's there's fun talk and then there's serious talk, right? Like you just you just reference something that happened during the pandemic. I have similar, we all have similar stories, right? There's a, there's a lot of folks that could not get their primary care doctor. Uh, and I don't want to say it's one person's fault or one facility's fault. I think the whole system kind of just came to a halt. And there was, I'll just say in my own opinion, maybe a lack of a clear path of how to reboot everything. So you had people that couldn't get their regular appointments, their regular prescription refills. Uh, a lot of VA systems and civilian hospitals, I can tell you from family and friends, a lot of folks were, you know, we, telehealth became a thing, right? And even then, you still had to wait, and uh, weeks turned into months. And then, you know, someone in the um, perhaps a specialist office that you had to go to had COVID, so then they had to shut down for another two weeks. It just it just compounded like crazy, right? And to your point, when people were trying to get care for the first time. I mean, forget it. You got no file with them. You got no primary assigned. You're going to wait months and months and months like it's some other type of uh, country. So, I mean, a lot of people suffered. And I guess my point in 
wrapping it all into this is like you guys have been helping each other and also helping, like you said, what, 70,000 plus people. Everyone can relate to that. And it's a little bit of a reprieve to hear someone else acknowledge it and say it out loud. You know? Right, right. Uh, and like I always said, it's the biggest case of group thinking that we've ever seen in our lifetime. Oh, for sure. You know, where everybody just went and turned stupid. Yeah. And people people who had, you know, the fifth principle of patrolling, like is like where like I it doesn't make any sense. You know, like everything they're saying and writing doesn't make any sense. Uh and I was the COVID czar at at the Not Christian Officer Center of Excellence. Like like I was like reading I had to my it was literally my job every day. It was the most miserable job I ever had. I had to watch every news station. I had to read the CDC website every day. I had to, you know, get all the memos from HQDA, all the memos from the DOD. And then I had to publish a memo that the commandant would send out to say, hey, this is what we're doing, right? I don't care what you saw here. I don't care what you saw there. This is what we're doing. But yeah, to your, to your point, uh, yeah, we got to 70,000 followers and we didn't even realize we had a podcast, right? Like uh, we had a buddy of mine who was doing the streaming and he was like, how come you guys never plugged the podcast? And I was like, what are you talking about? I thought we just had like a Zoom channel, like YouTube channel or whatever. And he's like, I t- he's like, he's like, I take all your audio and I put it on uh, Spotify and Apple and all that stuff. And I was like, oh no shit. You know, I'm sorry, but like, if I can, I don't know if I can cuss or not. Um, I was like, uh, really? And he's like, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm like, well, and he's like, yeah, you get way more downloads than you get views. And I'm like, I don't even listen to podcasts. And I'm like, I, okay. Uh, and then we, we talked to each other and I was like, Hey, we got to do something good with this. Um, and we, so we decided to promote veteran and first responder owned businesses. Uh, and part of that, you know, mission set was that I, we get the part of the shirt is quit being a triggered pansy. And it's a reminder to all of us, right. Especially the veteran community that like, you got problems. We all got problems. And once you make it somebody else's problem, now, now it's, you just became a triggered pansy. Like, like, like work together, you know, you know, like it's okay that you're triggered, but everybody gets it. Um, so like with that, we got really sick of like the dysfunctional veteran tagline, you know, or like, you know, I'm a wounded warrior. I'm a, you know, like, all, like, again, I'm not hitting, I'm not hating on anybody that is wounded because I am one of them. Like, you know, and so it's like, no, we, we, we are still like we're probably some of the best people on the planet, some of the best minds, some of the best leaders, the hardest workers, it's like we're very functional. And when somebody says we're not, like that ruins like veterans are a minority. So if you if you say something if you say, as a veteran, careful there, like does I don't care that you're not tagging me in that. Like right. I, I completely different opinion than you or whatever. But um yeah, so we wanted to show people who were succeeding. Yeah. And we wanted to promote that, uh, especially like during COVID. And then the COVID aspect of it was you know, and the suicide rate, it, it's, we started doing a lot of like reading into it and, you know, it, it didn't work for the greatest generation to not talk about it. It didn't work for the forgotten generation, which is, you know, the Vietnam veterans and the Korean war veterans, mm-hmm. they were just forgotten. Nobody even know. You ask a kid what wars we fought, they might not even mention two of them. Right. And so them not talking didn't, didn't say that the suicide rates are the same, if not a little bit higher. And right now our Vietnam veterans are the highest, you know, the ones killing themselves. And it's like, well, we have technology now. We have social media. There is zero reason that a veteran should be alone. And then I, we all knew this, that, that were active, that were leaders. Well, not everybody, but I think the squared away ones did that. We knew that the army wouldn't slow down. The op tempo is not going to slow down. So if you're going to make all these COVID rules and people can't leave bases, they can't leave their barracks rooms. They can't you know, like, but, but they're still out there getting after it every day. Like, and the stress and, you know, that's mounting up and they don't get to, you know, go relieve it somehow. They don't get to go unwind or chill or whatever. And then think of the spouses, that kind of stuff too, like all cooped up mental health crisis exploded during COVID because of how, you know, how dumb people were making rules and not understanding the whole system of things when that happened. Yeah. So yeah, yeah that's the, why we started it. So yeah, yeah, the inconsistency of what was shut down for what reason. You know, if it's if it's to avoid contact with people, then why were and I can't speak for where you live. I can just speak for my own experience up here. You know, there there were some towns where, like, everything that's socially healthy for you was shut down. Churches, right. schools, uh, 
<laughs> arcs, but, right? But then the casino was open. So, I mean, if you want to go and be like, you know, two inches from someone else. As long as you're wearing a mask. And, and be so sad and depressed and lose all your money, you know, and then go back home and be six feet away from your family with a mask. You know, that was that was somehow okay. But you couldn't go to church, couldn't go to the gym to work out. You couldn't, I mean, all these other things that would have been socially healthy, to your point about mental health. So, yeah, it was a it was a very much group think. Uh, unfortunately, Correct. Uh, and, and then and then we had a, a, a somebody recognized us who owned Grunt Works clothing, uh, not Grunt style Grunt Works. Uh, and, you know, he's like, hey, uh, I started this page Grunt Works. It's massive. It's got like 600,000 followers. Wow. And he's like, I, I, I might get a new job and I, I don't know if I want to run this anymore. He's like, I really like what you guys are doing. You know, would you partner up with me? Uh, and so we did, we partnered up with Gruntworks and then two years ago we bought it. So now Gruntworks is veteran trash talk. It's kind of like the, you know, the South African brewery thing where they bought all these beers, but they didn't change the name. So right. we bought, we bought Gruntworks. So it belongs to veteran trash talk, uh, but it's still Gruntworks. So it's, we got all their designs and their audience. And that page was on the brink of, you know, Facebook, uh, deletion because they're, you know, they kind of. A little more, a little more right of center, and so especially during things like that, and we've we've cleaned that page up a little bit, not much because it is grunt works. Uh, we we cleaned it up, and now uh, it's it's thriving and rocking and rolling again, and just you know it keeps increasing the following and reach, and I think we're at about nine hundred thousand now. Oh, so, wow. uh, congratulations! Yeah, it's that's fantastic. Yeah. And again, but it's the community that's doing it, yeah. right? Like, and it takes a while for people to understand how genuine you are about it. Um, and we still get the bro bets that come on there and yell at us, you know, it's like. Like, you know, like, hey, man, like, if you want to compare ERBs with, like, you know, let's say Buddy on our show. Buddy's, like, the most qualified soldier in, like, modern history as far as all the schools he's been to and Green Beret, Ranger, everything. You know, right. it's like, I mean, he's on here and he, I mean, you don't think he's a bum? I don't know. Like, <laughs> we're just sitting here trying to have a good time, man. It's our own mental health therapy and we're yeah. promoting, let's say we're promoting Rob in the show. It's like, it's what we're doing. Like, like, yeah. sorry. <laughs> like, but yeah, it's a. It's been a, a really awesome ride, and it's turned into a lot of really great things. Yeah, and I want to I want to get back to your own service and your own transition. I'm, I'm curious about a few things there, but just so I don't skip any lines, I didn't realize that the uh, the, the uh, clothing company is, is part of the brand now. So could you maybe just for a listener's sake, give me the uh, names of the websites and things? We'll make sure all the links are below. Oh, sure. It's uh, shop.veterantrashtalk.com. Uh, or if you just go to veterantrashtalk.com on our main website and click shop, it'll go there. Uh, like I said, all the grunt works clothing line, they got real popular with their Marine crayon line. So, uh, a lot of fun, a lot of fun shirts there. Uh, yeah, and then I saw them. most, yeah, m- most of our original shirts like this one are all centered around just like messaging to the veteran community, uh, uh and, and to ourselves. Like this is the best travel shirt to ever, ever. I, I wear it every time I travel. Like, and like, again, because if you want to, we always say on the podcast, you want to see a downfall of humanity, just go to the airport. Like, just just, just watch somebody destroy a, 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 a poor young lady working at a ticket counter because the flight's delayed. Like, you, you think she delayed the flight? <laughs> like, um, <laughs> or when the plane stops and everybody stands up, you know, it's like, you're in row 60. Like, sit down. <laughs> like, or, like, so... I, I just think it's one of the best shirts, but yeah, uh, shop.veterantrashtalk.com has all the all the all the clothing on there. Yeah. And we are, like our favorite one is get the demon out. Uh, we always say that because part of this shirt goes into that is you know the demon is yours. Mm-hmm. You have to own it. You have to understand it. Right. Uh, but you don't have to fight it alone. No one's going to help you fight it if you don't get it out. Like tell your battle buddies, hey, I'm struggling with this. You know and that's kind of how VTT official, our support group started was, Hey, you got a problem, put it on here. There's, there's, there's 80,000 people on that page. You know, maybe, maybe 10 people are in your neighborhood, maybe five, you know, like have done the exact same thing you did. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of where the clothing goes with that. It's a lot, a lot of fun and serious. So. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. That's, that's great that you guys are doing that too. So now when you, when you left, I'm just curious, I, I always, you know, I personally, when I, when I traveled and, you know, you do your time, I came home, I wound up eventually, not, not really, but eventually I settled back pretty much right where I was born. 
<laughs> but that's not always the case for veterans. So I'm sure I'm just curious about for you. Did you wind up settling where maybe you were stationed at one point or did you go back to where you're from or a whole new area? How did that, how did you get settled? Yeah. I, I stuck around in El Paso uh, for a couple of years, uh, just recently moved uh, out to California. Um, I, uh, I really, really enjoyed El Paso, but plus I have, I have two daughters. Uh, one's a sophomore, one's a freshman, you know, and they, and they're moving around and they're really good athletes. They're in sports. And I was like, dang, I, I don't know if I really want to move them right now because they're just starting high school. And so I left it up to them. I said, Hey, look, I go, and then my wife is from where we just moved back to in California. Oh, okay. And, so your family and, 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 yeah. And so she followed me around for 15 years, raising kids with no, with no help. You know, except for, I shouldn't say no help. We had our community of our brothers and sisters and their spouses, you know, and like there was always that. And especially when you get like a ranger tab, your community gets a little smaller, but they're, you're kind of end up being in the same spot a lot and, you know, same, you know, same uh, career path. So we had a lot of family friends that we created that were support network. But then again, still not, it's not family. It's not being able to just go see your mom, go see your sister, go like, you know, have somebody watch the kids, that stuff. Uh, and then when we deploy, they're stuck on their own and like, you know, nothing to do and talk about mental health. The, the spouses really do battle, battle at heart. Um, but yeah, so I, we, you know, my girl said, Hey, uh, yeah, I wouldn't mind moving back to California. So we did and so that, that. Yeah. I'm, I'm never, Oh, I'm from Wisconsin originally. So I, I am never going back to the cold, like never, <laughs> ever again. Yeah. Uh, I'll yeah, go on a I ski did, trip. I didn't learn. I was I was yeah. born and raised near Buffalo, New York. I'm, I'm still yeah. uh, Maybe I'll go on a ski trip, you know, where, you know, there's some 10th mountain, you know, <laughs> yeah. bourbon. With me. A few hours north. We could do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I'll stay in. I'll stay in the sunshine. I like it. Yeah. Uh, people, people think Buffalo has the worst winters. It, they're rough. But if you were in Wisconsin, you know, it's, it's not, you know. It's not as rare as people think. It's because we have sports. People see it on TV. They see the Buffalo Bills. They see the snowstorms. You know, we have a Buffalo Sabres. And, you know, you get a lot of footage that way. But it's actually much worse as you go north, obviously. So Syracuse, Fort Drum, Watertown, those areas get clobbered every year. Oh, Um, gross. We we can skip skip a year. You know, we can have one or two. Like last winter, we had maybe three big storms. Which means we'll probably get off a little easy this. Well, I hope. Oh <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but you know, the farther north you go, you're getting clobbered every winter. So yeah, uh, I guess yeah, so I I really enjoy outdoor activities, and I always make a joke with people from the Midwest or from you know the North. I go never gamble against somebody who's from the Midwest or the North in an indoor activity. Like don't <laughs> don't gamble against them in pool. Don't gamble against them in bowling. Darts. darts. Yeah. Like. Uh, like they, we spend <laughs> half of our year inside. So just, just like, don't go thinking you're going to be a better baseball yeah, or football player than somebody yeah, from the South. Well, like, yeah, yeah, you're, you're spot on. There's a town not too far from where I live now that was in the Guinness Book of World Records for the most amount of bars in the single mile. Yeah. And uh, it no longer holds that record, but growing up, it was bar, 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 bowling alley, bar, bar, bowling alley, bar, bar. <laughs> Yeah, I made so a joke when, this, when I first. When the city yeah, was shut ahead. down for a winter storm, all of those businesses were booming, <laughs> popping. Yeah, and then we had like snowmobile trails to ever the bars. Yes, like you know, like so now not only on a thing that's going eighty miles an hour on ice and snow, you're drinking like beautiful. What could go wrong, you know? And so, <laughs> but I I remember going to uh, driving, you know with my, my wife for the first time when she was my girlfriend. And I was like, we're going to go to my local bar. And you pass like five bars going to your local bar, you know, <laughs> and, they're, and, they're, and they're all packed. You know, it's like two o'clock in the afternoon. I'm like, it's happy hour. And where, where else do you think people would be? <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So, well, let me, let me ask you this. I know you mentioned a few leaders and lessons already, but is there, is there one in particular? And of course you were a leader, but is there one lesson in particular from your service days that now running a business or doing a podcast family life just in general is there one kind of prevailing maybe like a a mantra that keeps coming up from the service days yeah for sure i had a i was a a young uh see yeah i was a young staff sergeant and we had marcus evans colonel marcus evans uh take over our battalion uh and then he then took over 
375, then the 75th, and then was the chief of staff of SOCOM, and now he's a 25th uh, division commander. But the way he carried himself and the way that he trained and the way that he trained us uh, was something that I'll never forget. And, it, it, you know, it was one of those... It was one of those leaders that he listened to what you said. And if you had a problem and you had maybe an idea of a solution, he entertained you, right? Now, if you had a problem with no solution, then he crushed you, right? Like, like, like so, but one of the things that he always stuck out to me that I see, I, sh- I struggle with my, more in my civilian life, especially as a father. And I talked about this on the show uh, and I go to therapy. That was my main goal, reason to go to therapy is, uh, I remember after one live fire, he goes, how come there was so much screaming out there and yelling? And I was, we we're sitting there like, I don't know, it's a live fire. You know, like yelling at everybody, you know, cause he's like, then didn't you guys rehearse and train? He's like, like you're the only reason you should ever yell is if you lost control. Mm-hmm. And you know, what he was getting at is, is you either lost control of your formation or you lost control of your emotions or you, or both. Right. And he, he didn't say that there wasn't a time to not yell. He's like, so if you got a fire team that's way off and they can't, they're not answering the radio, you got, might have to yell. Right. If you have a safety you know, issue where, you know, somebody's about to commit fratricide, you yell. Right. Because at this point you've lost control. But if everybody's where they're supposed to be and everybody or somewhat where they're supposed to be, like, why are you yelling? Like, why are you screaming? And I didn't even realize at the time he was talking about other things, too. Right. He wasn't. He wasn't just saying in you know like in the heat of battle. It was like, or even a range or a, you know simulated warfare. It was like control your emotions, like because once you start yelling, that means everybody around you knows you've lost it, right? And again, it's not saying that it's not justified to lose it sometimes, but uh, and then like I said, that that's what uh, that's what's carried over the most to me, and just how much he put into like the intricate details of planning an operation. Uh, and, you know, he put it on us to do it. And I've had a lot of colonels and a lot of sergeant majors that they knew what was going on and they were really great at it, you know, and, but he, he like, just, just the way he delivered it and the way he was always calm, you know, and the way he'd be like, well, what, what happens if this happens over here? You know, and he already knew that. He already knew that that was going to be a hole in your plan, but he lets you go through it, right? And, and then it lets you experience it. And then, you know, and, and then you'd clean it up and you'd make it better. And I just, I just think how, how, how much he actually cared about soldiers and how hard he trained us. Um, it just made us, you know, phenomenal human beings uh, in both, you know, service and in life. So I kind of carry that on in my career to where I was like, I, I, I turned it into, I called it like uh, Colonel Evans, uh, three tenants, even though these weren't his, I just said they were, uh, and made them mine. I was like, make everybody around you more lethal. Right. Uh, make everybody around you uh, better. And then three, make somebody in your, whoever you touch, make somebody make a better life decision. And then but not, not like, then keep the force strong. So he was really good at that. Make everybody better and lethal. Make somebody make a better decision in their life because they know you because they're like, do they're going to do the right thing because Either afraid of you or they've heard it from you or they respect you, but they're going to change their life. Right. And, and then keep the force strong. Like, is this person valuable to us? Does the person have potential to be valued to us? Well then put your time and effort into it. Right. And then, you know, make sure that you keep the force strong and we keep the standards of discipline the way it's supposed to be. So yeah, that's my, my favorite guy was, uh, he's still in uh, major general Evans. That's fantastic. What a great legacy that he's passed on to so many. I mean, you picked up on it. I'm sure there's plenty others that have done that. So it's, that's what that's what people that aren't familiar with the military kind of miss. They they don't, you know, they think we all work for Uncle Sam. You know, we work for a bunch of bureaucrats. No. Right. We we work with a team of professionals that you're willing to die for, and they're willing to die for you. And you you pick up a ton of lessons that has, like you said, less to do with combat and more to do with the, your life post service. So, you think of how leaders like that and yourself are making not just better uh, platoons, but better families, better communities, better businesses, right? 
So that's that's fantastic. That's that's yeah, gonna fun. be like the nicest compliment for him. We we should we should make a clip and send it off to him here. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah, he knows he I think he knows it. Uh okay. yeah, it was a, it was amazing to me. Like when I was in RI, my my back had went out and you know, he had asked me to come to to Ranger Regiment with him uh when he left. And at the time you couldn't go at my rank, and then they changed it that you could. And somehow, I don't know, I mean, this is just the person that he was. My phone rang, and it was a Georgia number, and I was like, I didn't have it saved in my phone. And I answered, I was like, hello? And he was like, he's like, is this uh, Sergeant First Class Catrill? And I was like, it is. And I'm like, is this Colonel Evans? And he's like, it is. You know, and I'm like, <laughs> he's like, he goes, why are you going to Hawaii? And I was like, um, didn't know you knew I was going to Hawaii. But I was like, I go, oh, I go, it was either Alaska or Hawaii, and I gave my wife the choice. And it was Hawaii, pretty pretty quickly, you know, out of her out of, out of her mouth. Uh, and he goes, "Well, why aren't why don't you come hang out with us?" You know, and I was like, "Ah, you don't know. You're not tracking. My back went out. Like, and it's there's no way I could go to Ranger Regiment. Like, not a chance. Like, when when last a week in RASP. Uh And he goes, "All right, well, um, got a good friend of mine. He's taking over a brigade there." He's like, I'll make sure that you're in that brigade and you'll, you'll, you'll respect his, you know, methodology and his training. And I was like, Oh, perfect. You know, and cool. literally like a, a, two days later, I got a call from a good friend of mine now, Sergeant Major at the time. He was like, apparently people know who you are and you're coming to me. And I was, like, <laughs> I was like, I'm not that much of a legacy. I just, I just, you know, somebody was just looking out for me and making sure I went to the right place. So if you're in charge of that place, that's a compliment. Like he's making sure I'm coming to you. So yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, well, I'm so so impressed, and, and I'm I'm excited for what you're doing with uh, the podcast, the business, everything you're doing. It's it's just fantastic. Um, do you ever sit and just reflect at all about life lessons that you know now, and if you if you could have a moment with your younger self before you went off to boot, before you went to Relax in Jackson and all that the very first go around. <laughs> you, you ever think about, man, if if I had like a minute with my younger self, I would have said this. Uh, any any message you'd uh, convey to? I would have skipped the Jackson one. I, yeah. I would have just. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but it, I don't think I would redo uh, anything as far as my mentor because I already pretty much already had my mind set out what I was going to do. Like I said, it was mm -hmm. Tom Sheen and I mean. Charlie Sheen and Tom Berenger's fault. I was like, I said I was either going to be <laughs> so those movie, man. They yeah, I was going to be one of those two guys, right? Uh, <laughs> but I, I think I had a I had a really good upbringing. I was raised well, um, you know, middle class, uh, you know, hardworking family, and I, I, I think I would have. I think I would have. You know, I wish I would have been a little bit more professional, faster. I could tell myself like, Hey, it's a lot of fun. You know, it's a lot of like, but go like learn, read, like I, I would say just become a professional soldier faster. Uh, I think that's what I would have told myself. Like, Hey, pay attention to what some of these dudes are saying. Like, you know, pay attention to like why they're doing it, yeah. you know? And like that green book, you know, like I, I, what I, what I turned that life lesson into was I always tell people when I was a leader, I was like, Hey, write down the things that you don't like about. Like write them down yeah. and, you know, and then write down the things that you do like. And then after every level of leadership I was in, I, I had the, the group that was one level below me uh, come in and, and brief me those things. Right. And if some of those things were, you know, because they weren't looking out, I could explain that to them. Like, Hey, that's, those are things that we, you know, we have to do that you might not understand why, you know, that maybe it was my fault to not explaining it properly. Why, but like, and then there was things where you, then you self-reflect. It's like, dang, I did that to you. Or I said that to you or, you know, like, you know, like, or something like that. So I, I think that's, that's what helped me with that was, you know, making people listen and watch. And that, so I, I kind of enforced that on my under, people that were under me. So, that, so yeah, that's pretty much what I would go back and do and tell people to do what I was doing, making them do. Yeah. Like, that's brilliant. That's a great strategy. It, it, Win win. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. Yeah. Hopefully, I'm making you better because, like, you saw the dumb stuff I did and some of the good stuff I did. And so, it's just don't do that dumb stuff because you so, didn't work with you. It's not going to work with the people <laughs> under you either. So. 
Oh, that's fantastic. So, well, this this has been real fun. I, I really appreciate the uh, time and sharing with us everything you're doing. And, um, you know, we did, we, we should have touched base on our, our one mutual uh, friend, you know, friend of our show we've had. Oh, the Angry years. Colonel. Yeah, Angry <laughs> Colonel Rob. Uh, like I said, great, great, great person. Uh, yeah. You know, he's been a big supporter of Veteran Trash Talk, and he's got his uh, – he's got so many different – podcast he's doing now he's got as for football as for uh, football yeah that was yeah, we put the uh, was it uh stories from the front line what was that one uh i'm screwing that up he's gonna get mad at me because i was actually on it but um you know he, he's he's a no no nonsense kind of guy and you know and I, I love promoting his stuff he's got a great group going on with the football picks and I, i'll download it you know and, and put it on all of our platforms and you know see if uh See see what can happen, but yeah, Rob's a Rob's a great human being, and I I am I'm glad I got to know him and still know him. Yeah, it's Rob Robinson, and uh, awesome first name, of course. And uh... yeah, for sure. I mean, who who could go wrong with that? <laughs> we got we to get you a nickname. <coughs> we got the Angry Colonel, and we got we got Buffalo Bob. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's just, funny. Just came up with it like that. So yeah, I, I think my favorite part of of just you know, these types of conversations, it's, we, we all spent some time in the same organization. All right. And, you know, the, the, the as things, as things um, that we experience can be really graphic at times, it's almost like it kind of bonds, you, know, you go through an experience together, even, even though you and I weren't in the same truck or patrol, we have an appreciation for what we have all done at some point. So it's like we got shared DNA to some on some level, and as we leave the military and we reconnect outside of the military, it's kind of it's kind of like running into a cousin at the mall or something. You know, it's like <laughs> you, know. you you brought something up that caught my eye when I was a younger person, and I I, I was on my first my first R R and R, and it was during it was Fourth of July, and. I'm at my hometown Fourth of July festival. There's two World War II veterans, right? And one was Army, one was Navy. But I, I was paying attention to them, uh, and one was like dumping beer down the other guy's back, you know. And then they like they start like scrapping, you know. And these, at the time, they were what probably eighty something, you know. And I'm sitting there like, it doesn't change. It, it, it like <laughs> they're sitting there messing with each other, like probably like they did in the barracks. Um, <laughs> So yeah, you're spot you're spot on about that, and, yeah. and again, that's why it it really hurts me to to you know know that there that the veteran suicide rate is so high uh, because and like my buddy Joe, who I started Veteran Trash Talk with, you know, he said no veteran killed himself in a room full of other veterans. So it's like with social with social media, how come we can't have a room full of veterans at all times? Agreed. At all times. Yeah. Agreed. <clears throat> We'll have to get you on the show too. We'll uh, we'll schedule you and get oh, you on the trash I'd talk be, hour. I'd be honored. Yeah. It's uh it's fun. I don't I don't talk as much trash other than you know Army Navy game. I, uh... Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, we well we you know we start off the show with a conspiracy theory uh, to like I mean none of us know what the conspiracy is. Like the show will be tomorrow. I don't know what the conspiracy is. So when I get on live, uh, Dave will give us the conspiracy. And it kind of we do it to remind ourselves of like barracks the barracks talk yeah. when. Everybody's an expert yes. and everybody knows what they're talking about. And uh, maybe, maybe half of us are right. Maybe like at some point. I miss, you know, the, I, I miss the barracks lawyer. I always want to have. Yeah. Some, quote me incorrect information about a regulation. Yeah. But he, he knows just enough for you to believe it, you know, like, so maybe he's before got something war, there. Before our deployment to Iraq, there was all types of those, you know, like, Oh no, no. If you're, I'm exaggerating, of course, but no, no, no. If your cousin's neighbor's roommate was in a war in the last 50 years, they can't deploy you. No, no. Yeah, no yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it's a, it's a lot of fun. It kind of breaks the guest in because, you know, it takes me about a minute to write the script for the show. Uh, oh, it's fantastic. You know, like we got a, we got a guy coming on, a, a guy who wrote a book. Uh, we get a lot of authors that come on, but he's a fister. Uh, you know, an enlisted guy, and I'm like, there's no way this guy wrote a book. So I was like, I, I, so in the in the script, I said, I go, I go, you can when it's your turn to talk. I go, just you know, tell us how many times you said that a fister is just like infantry, only better. 
like you know like i'm like or talk about your book i don't care you know <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> but he loved it you know and so again it's uh again just bringing light to what people are doing and yes yeah Lo- locally positive yeah locally we i used to you know we had pretty before covid it was a bigger event but uh, the army navy game was huge around here because uh, right. In Buffalo, there's a lot of different units. There's, there's actually a huge veteran population in Erie County, New York, because there's, I mean, you have a naval base, you have Coast Guard, you, you have you have Air Force, but you have multiple branches right here, and a lot of people settle. So I think the last stat I saw was um, something north of 80,000 veterans are registered in the local VA hospital here. So, you know, you have a you have a military-themed party of any sort that's open to the public. It gets busy. But if you have the same one consistently, it's really it's really fun to see the same people every year. So I went ten years in a row, same VFW, Army nice. Navy game, right? But it was the nine years where the Army lost. <laughs> oh, I got a great story about that too. Go yeah, on. yeah, go yeah. for it. But but my my fun thing is I just I just double down every year. Every year it's like this is our year. I'm, you know, I'm a Bills fan. I know the drill. You just gotta say you're winning regardless of what the score is. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, oh, the Bill. Hey, big win last night. Uh, no, we had. A, what year was that? What was the year where the quarterback for Army fumbled and was crying on the fifty? Oh yeah, line? I, I was. There. Yeah, two, that's one of them. So that was 2015, uh, 14, 14? It was probably. I'm going to say it was twelve or thirteen for. Sure. Yeah, thirteen. I mean, yeah, we're talking. So those guys came to Ranger School, right? That that graduating class, and I was a I was a primary instructor in Florida at the time. Yeah. And so I knew that some of them are West Point football players, and I'm like, "Hey, where's that quarterback at?" You know, and I got we're out we're out in the field, right? And I'm, yeah. I'm like, "Are you crying on 50 yard line because you fumbled? Like, and you had to have a four star come hug you, and like that made you feel better, did it?" And I'm like, and "I'm like, what? What are you going to do in combat when things don't go right? Are you going to hope? Are you hoping a four star comes and hugs you and brings you through it? You know, and I'm." I'm Take it, I'm abusing my privileges and alright to say whatever I want to somebody, you know. But you know, I was like, no, I, you know, then I was like, I was like, oh, I'm just messing with him, you know. Like I had, a, <laughs> but yeah, we got it. Yeah, don't be fun. Don't be crying. Because, yeah, I, yeah, I remember one of them. Ball back up and get going. Yeah, I don't remember the names. I just remember one of them had a bad. One of them was already overseas and came back as a Mustang. He was enlisted and then he went back to, uh, but yeah, it did it so yeah. long ago. It's hard to remember the names. But uh, yeah, it's fun. And the, and the Navy folks, um, I got really sick. I, it was I was actually hosting the party a few years in a row. So you know, I was the jerk that would yeah you know start everything off, have a little fun speech. Army loses, army loses every year after year after year. After year. And I got really really sick. I actually had a, a breakout of shingles, which I, that was a new chicken experience. pox vaccine, baby. There you go. Yeah, yeah, it was a new experience for me. So the short version is, it happened literally the week of the game. I could not go. I couldn't even go. But but I'm watching the game, you know, like this on my bed, barely, yeah. barely functional. And I and I got my uh, this this is, I guess I might have had a smartphone at that time. I'm not sure, but I at least had a text. I remember because everyone's everyone's just giving me help because the Navy was actually suffering. Like it was it was a great game for the Army. We we dominated after nine years of losing. So the the Navy guy the Navy guys were blaming me, right? <laughs> that uh, because I wasn't there, their team is losing for the first time. The army guys are blaming me that I was obviously the curse for going all those years. Right. Yeah. Yours, yours, you're done now. Yeah. You stay home. <laughs> so, great experience. But to your point, you get, you get best together, call your buddies. And even if you don't think you have buddies, go down to the local, you know, whatever, name your, name your post, Legion, whatever, go online. You know, there's lots of great groups like yours. People can chime in and uh, within five minutes, your mood has improved, you know, hundred percent. So like I'm, I'm in a good mood right now. So yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> like going to yeah. the gym. So I'm so glad, I'm so glad you guys are doing what you're doing because it's helping a lot of folks and uh, it's fun stuff. So, uh, so thanks again for today. And and folks, again, this is a uh, Nick Cottrell, awesome veteran, of course, and you want to check out his, his uh, work. You want to check out his clothing site and also veterans trash. Oh, sorry, veterans talk trash. No, veteran veteran trash talk. Veteran trash yeah. talk dot com. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Veteran trash talk dot com, and uh, definitely chime in and uh, see how you can support his his mission, his business, everything these these guys are doing. So it's just fantastic. I thank you so much for the time.
All right, too easy, Robin. Uh, again, uh, we donate most of our profits because we don't really, we either pay admin or we donate them to uh, the Ultimate Sacrifice Foundation out of New York, actually. So, uh, oh, that's fantastic. Uh, so yeah, we'll put a, we'll put a link up about that as well. That's fantastic. So, all right, perfect. Yeah, thanks for having me, Rob. It's awesome. Yep, thank you so much.